Hello, 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 hello. Hello. Are you ready for an incredible session on the polls? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> now, what I'm, one of the reasons why I'm incredibly excited about this session is because uh, the polls uh, are storytellers. They tell the story of the past, of our planet, and they tell the story of the future, of our planet and where we are going. But sometimes we can be quite detached from what's happening uh, up or down there. And uh, one of the things that we are going to explore during these sessions uh, is uh, not only what's uh, going to happen on a climate, what's happening on a climate level, but also how the climate changes on the poles, uh, they're affecting uh, indigenous communities, and they're going to affect us all <laughs> in uh, the other areas of the world. And we're going to hear from incredible panelists and incredible speakers uh, in uh, those uh, topics. Uh, my name is Simone Vincenzi, and I'm going to be your host for uh, this uh, particular session. And uh, I want to introduce now our first uh, uh, panelist. Uh, she's an award-winning visual journalist and filmmaker, and she's documenting climate change in the Arctic. So please give a massive round of applause to Anna Filipova. <laughs> Hello. Before we start, let's watch something first. Environment have changed a lot. The sea ice is melting. For every year we lose about four days of sea ice. Svalbard is special because sea ice is melting. It's about twice as fast than any other place in the Arctic. What we have seen uh, is uh, that females have problems getting to the denning areas because they don't have sea ice in some of traditionally important areas where they go and give birth. This is the only reason why we need to follow this population. I'm working for the Norwegian Polar Institute, which I've done since 2003. But the Polar Institute have actually had an annual program on for a long time, since 1987. Every spring we capture bear by immobilizing them from a helicopter. We also take a lot of measurements of the bears, so we can see how well they are doing, how much they are growing and so on. And we take a lot of samples. Those samples are used uh, in different studies for health, pollutants and feeding ecology. We also color uh, females with GPS, so we can follow that female and see where she's walking. And that way we've actually learned that they can have very, very different space use strategies. Most of the bears that belong to the Barents Sea population, that in total uh, have 3,000 bears, they follow the sea ice. And they have a challenge, you know, when the sea ice uh, retracts further and further north every year, they get long distances that sometimes they have to swim to get between the islands where they have their important denning areas. So what we have seen only those 20 years where I've been here, it's been large changes, uh, much, much less sea ice. Those bears that stay in Svalbard year round, of course, they have to be on land a lot more of the time than they used to. So we do think that if the prediction is correct that sea ice is going to be continuing to melt, we think that polar bears in Svalbard might uh, get into trouble in the future. And it's very important for us to try to find out what we can do to try to protect different areas, if that's something that could help the population. Wow, Anna, what, what a way to start, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> An everyday work day <laughs> in the Arctic. Because, uh, you know, as we saw even on the video, living on the Arctic, uh, in the Arctic, like you live there full time and can be considered very extreme <laughs> for many. <laughs> what does your passion from uh, the Arctic come from? Yes, so my first project in the Arctic was about 12 years ago, and it was in North Greenland with uh, two Inuit hunters. And we were crossing about 200 kilometers uh, on the sea ice in the area of Thule, and this is just under the North Pole. And in February, the temperatures could be up to minus 46, minus 50. So for this project, I had to learn two sets of very particular skills, such as um, operating a rifle, as it's um, in polar bear country, and how to um, ride a dog sledge, because we were crossing the sea ice. 
Um, the next two weeks with them was something which was both physically and mentally exhausting, painful and challenging, but I was thriving and I found myself in my element. Um, so this is how my story started and my passion became my lifelong mission to convey the emergency of environmental issues from the Arctic. W what did you see there that made you say as a journalist, as a visual storyteller, I need to show this? Uh, what, there was something that made you see, this is what I want, need to show. It is unique environment, it is unique way of life and being there full time you can immerse yourself into this environment uh, by living there and not just coming for small periods of time which most people do. I can work on long term projects and create in depth scientific works. I specialize on environmental and scientific projects and for example Last year I had the possibility to spend the whole dark season in the northmost science station in the world, which is New Alson. And it's um, situated just under the North Pole. It's the biggest laboratory for modern Arctic research in existence. And we have 24 hours darkness, so it is quite an extreme environment and it's not for everybody. Um, during the dark season, the science station is quite empty, but it was incredible to experience this extreme environment. Uh, our projects were taking place outside, so we had to wear constantly flare guns, rifles, and headlights to see, because there is no light pollution, so when it's dark, it is 100% dark. And we use the moon as a light source, so we it's the moon is our sun so the landscape is something that it's absolutely sublime what uh, what is something you've learned about yourself that's a, a personal question that i'm curious about what is something that you learned about yourself by living uh, in such extreme conditions because i think that living uh, in such an environment uh, as you mentioned is very testing and uh, a lot of people <laughs> i would argue would have quit <laughs> <laughs> like, no, that's not for me. I'm sorry. Uh, I need some sun. I need some warmth. Uh, I need at least some sunlight. What did you learn about yourself during that experience? I, I think it's much easier to live there than here. Okay. <laughs> but okay, tell, uh, tell <laughs> but uh, I think uh, I thrive when uh, I'm in a place uh, to, to think outside the box, to, to find ways to be creative in such a place, as you said, that is extreme and hostile. So I just love these uh, places. That, that, that's, as you mentioned, is yeah, your element. You find yourself at home. It is, yeah. Uh, one of the reasons uh, why I'm excited about having this conversation is because uh, you have a unique point of view. Because uh, you work with scientists, you work with communities, uh, you work with uh, a lot of different people, other journalists. Uh, so you have a vantage point that is different uh, from others. Uh, what lessons can you share with us from, uh, from your perspective? Um... I have witnessed that women are greatly unrepresented in the field and with my work I have learned that I can give voice and I can elevate women. Um, for over 10 years working in the Arctic, I am usually the only woman in a project, uh, women are just not included and to sort the climate crisis we need women in leadership positions on the field. We need the female perspective. Um, so I'm really proud that in my work, I convey both the representation of women and the uh, raising awareness on environmental issues from the Arctic. And I it is important uh, to mention that one of my last projects uh, for the New York Times uh, last year on the biggest ground station uh, in the Arctic, which specialize on satellites, was selected as project of the year for the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And with this project, I brought women on front page in a major industry where women are not seen. So with the media, 
we have to recognize we can influence the next generation. Well, please give a round of applause for that. <laughs> Thank you. Because uh, um, I was uh, uh, I was moderating another panel a couple of um, on the first day uh, about women empowerment uh, and the women for change, and uh, representation was uh, the key of uh, like of the, the conversation uh, where we can see someone like us uh, there. So what can be done? Uh, so you mentioned from the part of the media. So media definitely have a role to play to showcase the work of, like yourself or great women that are working in the Arctic. What else can be done? Just accommodate women because it's very easy uh, for just simple reasons like, oh, we cannot bring women because they're just simply not bathroom facilities. We ah. cannot bring women because there are no so small we are going sizes. So like literally from there are no bathroom facilities. Like that's it's very easy. So, so as you saw in, uh, for example, with the polar bear documentary, I was the only woman. And this is something that I experience most of the time. Uh, so definitely it needs to be created a more inclusive environment because uh, it's not that there are not uh, women that, <laughs> that we there are women uh, that uh, are doing incredible work uh, but we just need to create a more uh, a better environment not only this there are lack of women on leadership positions okay. you can find women in jobs but not in leadership positions so we need to change that mm. okay uh, i know uh one of the parts uh, of your work uh, is uh, showcasing the effect of climate change, as is uh, happening in front of our eyes. A lot in the but in a lot of documentaries that, for example, I see <laughs> on TV or Netflix, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the emphasis uh, is uh, on uh, iceberg melting. Uh, and that's the biggest images that we see around. But uh, I know that the impact of what's happening right now in the Arctic goes beyond that. So what are you seeing really um, happening out there in your work? So for the last 12 years, I have visited beaches on the Arctic. And these are places that are so far away, thousands of kilometers away from industries and pollution. And there hasn't been a single beach without plastic. Uh, it is really sad reality. and. The plastic is coming from Europe and North America, and it takes about two years to get stranded in the Arctic, and it damages the environment. It is very often mistaken for food by birds, fish, and other animals, and it's deadly. What else, uh, what else do you see? So one issue is the plastic. How about animals uh, and uh, like animals like polar bear. I know you're a big advocate for polar bears in your work, as we can so see from the documentary. I think the plastic for me is uh, the biggest uh, issue because, mm -hmm. as I said, uh, I haven't seen a place without plastic. The other thing is um, New Austin Station, which is the northmost station in the planet, um, and it's situated a couple of thousand kilometers from any industry. It is considered to have the cleanest air in the northern hemisphere, but even there we get all the pollutions through the atmospheric, atmospheric circulation from, again, Europe and North America into the region. So that's where everything com comes from. I, I'm curious, uh, from your perspective as a journalist, uh, um, no, journalists, uh, storytellers, and visual storytellers like yourself, they want to show what's going on, but what are the challenges in showing it? Uh, because uh, uh <laughs> like in any industry in particular, raising awareness is a big challenge. So what are the challenges that you have faced or you're facing? Uh, some are the technical challenges, <laughs> which is uh, working in extreme darkness, working in minus 30, minus 40 degrees. So um, you can imagine the equipment it doesn't behave <laughs> very very well in these conditions, so you have to think outside the box. And uh, some is uh, just to create projects to translate this scientific data in a um, much more easy to understand for the general public and see how it touches each of us. So this is the biggest challenge, how to translate the data. So what can be done to translate that? What are some of the examples? It's, it's just to make it more poetic, more beautiful, because mm -hmm. as we all know, uh, the um, scientific projects, they are just 
numbers and graphs, and it's very hard to relate with this data. And uh, most of the people, they, they don't understand what's happening in the Arctic and how the Arctic is going to affect them. But this is the place where the change starts first. So if it starts there, it will come here. So if it starts there, it will come here. Y you mentioned uh, b uh, the um, being able to think outside the box in those kind of conditions. So you, you are there, you're ready to, have, uh, to shoot something, uh, you're ready to create a piece of content, uh, and then something doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the ways in which you responded to these challenges? Give me an example of a project that you did. Well, I think for me it's not a problem because I'm based in the Arctic, so if it doesn't work, you, I'm there. I'm not... Uh, but if it's somebody who just comes for a couple of days to do a project, this is a problem for them. So with my first project uh, that I mentioned 12 years ago, I, um, I had a lot of issues because in minus 46, all the um, cameras, digital cameras, they stopped working. Uh, so I had analog camera, which continued to work. And you have to be very careful how and when do you want to use it. So you cannot be shooting uh, constantly. But uh, because now I live full time, I do not have this project, th this issue. So I have all the time that's, uh, that's to immerse a myself. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I want to talk uh, and focus more on polar bears now, because I know that a big part of your work is to raise awareness uh, about what's happening in the uh, for polar bears. Uh, how are they being affected by global warming and how are things looking like? Uh, so you saw with the documentary, uh, with my work with uh, Norwegian Polar Institute and Polar Bears International, I have the unique perspective to be on the ground and see what is happening. Uh, however, we cannot determine how, how long they're going to survive. Uh, the only thing we can say is this um, annual field trips are very important to see and predict what might happen. We know that the barren sea polar bears, which are one of the 19 population of polar bear across the Arctic, are the most affected due to the fastest sea ice decrease. And in the next decade, they're most likely to be losing profoundly their habitat compared to Canada, Greenland, US, and Russia. And what would be the effect on the entire world, though? If, uh, with the extinction of polar bears, because we, we all know that we live in a, when we are here, we know that we live in an interconnected world. Something is happening, it will have a knock-on effect in another area. So what's gonna, what's gonna happen to the ecosystem? I cannot speculate on this. You cannot <laughs> speculate on this. <laughs> okay. So if someone wants to support uh, the work that you're doing, uh, what is the best way and uh, also what are you working on at the moment? So I'm working on uh, another project on power bear research and on um, air pollution. Uh, as I said, uh, in New Alson is the cleanest air in the Northern Hemisphere, and this is where the pollution for the rest of the world starts to be measured. And currently it's uh, 420 parts per million, which is extremely high level. Mm. So you can imagine what uh, is for the rest of the world. And uh, how can someone who wants to support your work and see it uh, as well? Uh, it's going to be published in a couple of weeks, so you can all follow me on social media. <laughs> right, so check it out <laughs> on social media and also in the New York Times. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anna. It has been a great pleasure having a conversation with you. Please give her a massive <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, thank you. Thank you. So from... Uh, <laughs> journalism and visual storytelling. Now we're going to talk more about facts, risks, uh, and uh, solutions. And the next part, I'm going to be joined by the one and only Heidi Sylvester. Please uh, welcome her to the show, <laughs> to the stage. And also, Gail Weidman, that is going to join us from, uh, uh, the, from Davos. Please take a seat. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. Well, we start with um, Heidi, you're a glaciologist, a uh, uh, member of uh, AMAP secretary, and uh, the work that you do is in particular bridging the gap between science, uh, uh, policymakers, uh, and science and society. That's a big part of work that you do. Mm, absolutely. Uh, so tell me a bit more about how did you get started in, in this and where, where did it start for you? 
I mean, for me, I was lucky enough to be born in the French Alps, um, and I spent my entire childhood and teenagehood hiking up and down these beautiful mountains. And when I was told that you can actually be paid to study those icy environments, I thought that sounded like a great job. And, and it was really through my studies in glaciology that I understood that if you want your science, your research to have an impact, it needs to be communicated. And today, outreach is one of my biggest missions and one of my biggest passions. And that's why we are here, to communicate and making sure that everyone can understand what's uh, the, the, the research and what's happening Absolutely. there. Uh, Gal, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. She's uh, the founder of Arctic Base Camp, a professor of sustainability at the University of Exeter, a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on uh, Frontier Risk, and also she was a scientific keynote speaker at Davos 2020 uh, talking about what's at stake in the Arctic. So, Gail, the question that I have for you is that what are the biggest risks right now that you are noticing uh, in uh, the Arctic at the moment? Well, first of all, I'd like to say to everybody, welcome to Base Camp. Uh, as you can see, I'm here in sunny Davos. So usually we set up Arctic Base Camp during a January snowy uh, setting, and uh, you know I'm I'm roasting here in the alpine uh, sun. So um, uh, hello from uh, Davos and from Arctic Base Camp. Uh, I think what we try to do very much is also on science communication, and our angle is really to identify the global risks for the rest of the world, um, both from a society perspective and from a, a business perspective, and really say, you know, the Arctic is a barometer of global risk, and, and what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay there. And there's lots of interconnections, and we highlight those to world leaders that come here uh, to Davos every year. We've been here since 2017, um, and, and it starts tomorrow, so we're, we're back again. Is that hectic at the moment uh, up there? Or <laughs> Well, well, the funny thing is, is if you've never been to Davos, um, it is absolutely a chaotic uh, a, a site once it kicks off. But the actual um, sessions kick off properly tomorrow. Um, so right now, there's a little bit of a lull before the storm, let's say. Okay, so that's why you couldn't join us today. Yeah, well. exactly. It was, it was, it was, it was uh, much easier. It, it, once it gets going, it's, it's more hectic. Right, that's brilliant. Uh, Heidi, one of the, um, when we had our conversation at the beginning, uh, you said something uh, about the impact of the war in Ukraine uh, that uh, I, uh, I would have never think about, uh, about how the war in Ukraine is actually impacting all the research that is happening right now in the Arctic. Can you expand on that, please? Yeah, of course. I mean, we're all aware of uh, the horrors that are currently taking place in Ukraine at the moment. And, um, and the consequences are really far-reaching. Um, what we're seeing in the Arctic at the moment is um, that we are really on the edge, we are about to lose collaborations with Russian scientists that took decades to build up. And we're about to lose everything right now. But when you look at the importance of Russia in the Arctic, Russia has 53% of the coastlines along the Arctic Ocean. If you look at the map of the Arctic, Russia is about half of the Arctic at the moment. If you look at the number of people living in the Arctic, half of these people are currently based in Russia. And the problem is that at the moment, it is very difficult to collaborate with the Russian scientists. If we look at the Arctic Council, for example, which is this forum made of the eight Arctic countries, the Arctic Council is currently being chaired by Russia, and the seven other countries of the Arctic Councils are refusing to collaborate with the Russian scientists. So let me tell you, the problem is that these scientific programs that are currently implemented have had to be put on hold, have had to be put on spot. And the climate keeps on warming. No matter the politics, the climate keeps on warming. And at the moment, the polar regions are screaming loud, and it seems that no one is hearing them. And if we don't do something about this, and if this is a relationship that you mentioned, it wasn't easy to build, it took decades to build. If those relationships are not reconnected, what's going to be the effect? What's going to be the impact? I mean, the consequences are very difficult because we do need data from the ground. We can use satellites, we can use planes to collect data from the atmosphere, from space. But we, what we're really missing is what exactly is happening in the field. I mean, if you look at Russia, at the moment, permafrost, so the frozen ground, is thawing all over the place. Big parts of Siberia are on fire at the moment. There are massive wildfires affecting the ecosystems, affecting uh, the populations in Russia. And if we 
remove this ingredient from our um, understanding of global warming in the Arctic, we remove half of what's currently taking place. So we do need to do our utmost to continue collaborating with the Russian scientists, no matter what. I mean, it's not time to focus on politics, it's really time to stick to the science for us, the scientific community. So the scientific community can be together and keep supporting each other and evolve and move forward. We must. Um, Gail, I'm curious uh, if uh, this is going to be a, a topic that is going to be explored as well at the World Economic Forum or if, if you know something about that. Um, we can right now. Yeah. Okay, you're back can now. You yeah. We can hear you, yes. Geopolitical instability is, um, a, of course, a major topic here at Davos this year. There's no question of that, and that, that will range from, from war, um, the financial system, uh, the food crisis, and, of course, climate change. Uh, we are bringing, actually, um, a Ukrainian climate scientist uh, to speak. Um, here in Davos as a keynote with us, Svetlana Krakowska, as well as um, uh, one of the, the Ukrainian climate activists, and, and really looking at climate uh, conflict and uh, uh, many different global threats. From an Arctic perspective, you know, I think that, that uh, the relationships with Russian scientists uh, will remain strong, um, even if there is a gap in terms of the way we can collaborate. I think those uh, ties are very, very deep. Uh, but we do need, and I agree with Heidi on this, that we, we do need on the ground um, uh, monitoring, uh, uh, especially things like like permafrost, but but the topic uh, on climate change and the Arctic is more than just uh, what's happening with with Russia. Of course, uh, you know I think what we're looking at is that the data in terms of global risks on extreme weather events throughout the mid latitudes, um, threats to food and water security, um, are going to only be magnified massively by the loss of Arctic summer sea ice and uh, glacier melt in in Greenland and and the greening, of course, of of the Arctic, uh, let alone permafrost thaw. So we've got sea level rise and we've got you know a perfect storm that's that's really coming from all fronts uh, from the Arctic. And, and, and you know, certainly I, I also, uh, uh, you know, sympathize very much with the, uh, the, 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 what uh, Anna said, that, that the pollution of plastic in the Arctic when she sees it is, um, you know, uh, so upsetting. But it's more than that. It's the microplastic. It's the stuff you can't see in the sea ice. And there's good data to show that it is just chock-a-block full of microplastic that is coming from, of course, consumption around the world. So we're raising the alarm bell here at Davos. And, and really talking about what are the solutions, um, clearly uh, those related to massive cuts to, to CO2 emissions uh, globally. Phase out coal, um, it's got an end date, 2030 is fast approaching us. And, uh, you know, we have to stop financing any kind of new fossil fuel development, not just in the Arctic, and there's some good movements in the, the banking community, but it's also uh, any new uh, fossil fuel uh, development anywhere in the planet is not going to keep us on the 1.5C uh, warmer uh, world, which is the trajectory that we know it keeps the Arctic uh, relatively stable, um, uh, and and that means that the rest of the planet is relatively stable. So so we have to avoid those 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 tipping points at, at all costs, and and that's why we come every year um, yeah. here here to Davos. Uh, I know actually uh, I have another question for you, Gail, because uh, I, I one of the big parts of your work uh, is actually communicating science uh, in a way yeah. that. Uh, we, <laughs> I'm talking, we from a non scientific point of view can understand. Uh, can you give us some examples that I yeah. know you give so that we can understand the, what's actually going on and the impact? Uh, yeah, Simona, I'll give you I'll give you two examples. Um, uh, one of them we're doing here at Davos, and and, and the other one we, we did at uh, COP26 in Glasgow. Um, you know, people know that the Arctic is melting, um, and they know it's bad news for the polar bear. But we try to say it's bad news for us. So at COP26 in Glasgow, we wanted to remind the delegates that that actually what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay there. So we actually brought an iceberg from Greenland, and uh, we put it outside the Congress area in a one of the the spaces with the financial. Um, uh, uh, community and let it melt and, uh, you know, try to, to really hammer home that, that delegates can make whatever decisions or lack of decisions that, that they do based on a political reality. Uh, but the physical reality is that it wasn't just that iceberg that was melting in Glasgow. It was all of the sister icebergs that, that are melting all of, all of the time. In addition, when we, we do something on glacier water, I mean, I would say that everybody in your audience knows that, that Greenland is melting and and it's melting a lot, and that's a problem. But what we decided to do was actually bring um, Greenland uh, melt water, which we have done. So here's a bottle of it right here. I don't know if your audience can see. Yeah, um, can see that. They're called um, 
Arctic Melt, and it's it's um, an ice cold uh, bottled warning. And and how do we try and communicate science? An example would be as so it's sort of a pop quiz for people watching. You know the Greenland is melting, but if I said that this bottle, um, which is about 750 milliliters, on average based on the science, how many bottles are melting a second? So, audience. Think of a number in your brain right now, or write it down, or tweet it out. And Simona, I'm going to ask you also to do this, and I'm going to ask also Haida, and if Anna's there as well. Now, Haida is a scientist; she may she may well know. Now, if I ask people, and I have, and I've asked a lot of people that knew a lot about climate change, and I'm not talking scientists; I'm talking, you know, policymakers and business leaders that are 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 focused on this, um, civil society actors. Almost nobody guesses that between 14 and 17 million bottles a second are melting based on a decade average of data that we have on Greenland. Let me repeat, 14 to 17 million. And that's what we try to say, it's coming to a shore near you. And I think that kind of stuff really, really hammers the message, message home. So that's one of the examples that we do, and we're doing it here in Davos, and we did it also in Glasgow at COP26. It does, and people need to see that because, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of the policymakers, uh, they are not people that are directly impacted, or they know enough <laughs> to make also those decisions. Uh, and we right. need to act yeah. now also to uh, stop, completely stop investment uh, in fossil fuels. Because uh, also what is creating, Heidi, is uh, a really huge extreme uh, in uh, the uh, environmental conditions and environmental events that uh, are happening, right? So what are some of the extremes that you've seen and how they're gotten worse from when you started your work? Yeah, I really want to echo what uh, Gail was saying, that extreme weather events in the Arctic are changing the game right now. I mean, we have to bear in mind that the Arctic is currently the fastest warming place on Earth. So the, the Arctic is warming two to three to four times faster than the rest of the world. The place uh, Anna was talking about, this archipelago of Svalbard, is warming six to seven times faster than the rest of the world. So the changes happening all over the Arctic are absolutely dramatic. So the trends of temperature are increasing, precipitation are being perturbed, but what is really changing everything are those extreme events. So what do I mean by extreme weather events? It's, for example, heat waves in the Arctic. And I was in Svalbard mid-March, and mid-March there was plus six degrees, when it's supposed to be minus 15, it was, was raining all over the place. Let's slow down. So it was supposed to be minus 15. It was supposed to be minus three, 15. Six. Yeah, exactly. Okay, plus five, plus six. It was a disaster. And what we're seeing at the moment is a really an increase in the magnitude and in the frequency of these weather, uh, extreme weather events. Wildfires are raging all over the place. We're seeing abrupt permafrost thaw, so the frozen ground is, fro is thawing faster than ever. We're also seeing the Arctic sea ice, so the frozen water over the ocean, uh, melting extremely rapidly. And what uh, Gail touched upon uh, briefly is the fact that we're getting closer and closer to these tipping points. What we mean is that we are inching closer and closer to these points of no return. And if we reach these points of no return, we will have irreversible consequences that were triggered by our activities in the first place. So for example, Gail mentioned the water from the Green and Ice Sheet, and I was lucky to actually taste this water a couple of months ago in a meeting in southern France. Um, when we look at the Green and Ice Sheet, it holds enough ice to increase sea levels globally by six to seven meters. And on Earth, at the moment, uh, on coastlines, we have more than 700 million people living between zero and 10 meters of elevation. So this is how important Greenland is. For Greenland, if we increase global temperatures beyond two degrees Celsius, we will not be able to stop the destabilization of the Greenland ice sheet. So this is why there are these temperature limits. This is why we often talk about 1.5, two degrees, because they have a real scientific meaning and we are getting closer and closer to these tipping points, which doesn't mean it's too late. It means that we still have a chance to avoid those irreversible consequences, but only if we act now. Talking about uh, acting now, <laughs> Gail, no, thank you. Let's give her a round of applause, please.
talking about uh, acting now, uh, one of the frustration that I think that a lot of the community that is involved in climate change uh, or sustainability is that there is a lot of talk, <laughs> in particular from people in power, but very little accountability sometimes uh, and very little action. Uh, what uh, are you doing, Gail, and what actually the, um, uh, there, the World Economic Forum, what can be put in place to keep those change makers and those policy makers actually uh, to account? Well, I think that it's not just what happens here at Davos, of course, it's what happens in many of the global meetings, inclu including the UNF Triple C um, uh, Conference of the Parties, which will happen in the fall again in, e in Egypt. And it's clear that, that we need, you know, NDCs, so nationally determined contributions, so commitments uh, to uh, emission reduction. Um, there needs to be accountability within that. And then we need to have that within the corporate side as well. And I think there's many big companies that are, are on science-based targets um, or on a, a 1.5C uh, strategy or, or at least uh, in discussions about that. And, and we just need we just need massive scale up. And and emissions are rising. You know, we had, we had a, a brief dip during the, the pandemic um, because of economic slowdown, but the bounce back has been robust, uh, unfortunately, and we're back on the um, uh, rising uh, uh, emissions trajectory, which is in the wrong way. So, so commitments are one thing, uh, and but we'll still go off the cliff if we don't actually get to action. And we're in the decade of action, so it, it's all hands on deck. And I think we really need to just make sure that that um, the, the money is going to go in the right places in order to scale up. That that low, low carbon uh, a, a transition, and it's got to be a, a rapid one. So there, there is no question of that. Um, uh, that the companies, governments, cities, uh, citizens, you know, we all have to half our emissions uh, by 2030 in half, right? So, so that's what we need to do, and, and we need to do it together, or we're just not going to make it. Uh, in, the, in our conversation uh, uh, to prepare for this particular session, uh, there was something that really caught my attention about the involvement of youth activists because uh, yep. a lot of the uh, uh, people that uh, can take action and uh, they're passionate about uh, uh, sharing information, they actually don't have access <laughs> to come to places where decisions are made. Uh, so how can you help youth activists being involved in the World Economic Forum, in Davos, or in places where those conversations happen, those uh, policy makers uh, are making those decisions? Well, I think it's more than, than youth activists. I mean, scientists are always also not usually invited on stage or into the room. So that's how we set up Arctic Base Camp. We said that we need to go to the World Economic Forum where people with power make decisions around global risks and they will determine largely what's going to happen to the future fate of humanity. So it, there was no room at the end to, to begin with when we came here. So we ended up setting up the tent that I have behind me um, and we camp in that tent. And we've got, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a place here at Davos that we that we're well known for and um, we decided that we should have uh, youth activists come as well in in 2019 uh, Greta Thunberg and her father asked to camp with us when they were coming for their first uh, presentation to the World Economic Forum and we were delighted to have them it was not sunny and warm it was minus 24 the night that Greta camped with us it was pretty darn cold um, and the next year we decided that we would bring um, a group of youth activists and I got some sponsors together um, and brought uh, six of them from uh, around the world, including Vanessa Nakate, who I, I believe she's also been speaking with Change.Now um, uh, either uh, today or, or yesterday. And we've got uh, six more uh, youth uh, uh, ambassadors coming with Arctic Base Camp uh, this year, and that's, that's sponsored by WWF UK. And they have a youth tent. They camp here, and um, we we try to bring them into as much as we can. Um, Sophia Kiani, um, who is one of our activists uh, ambassadors um, this year. She's also been speaking to, to Change.Now. Um, so those are the ones that come to Davos, but we also have a program where we are trying to um, share the science of climate change and of Arctic change to those uh, youth activists that are online. So we're really um, open to engaging with the youth and hopefully giving them the facts so that they know that what they're asking for is grounded in the science that we, that, that we have, you know, know is true so that more people can be involved. Please give a round of applause for this that is very well deserved. <laughs> One of the other problems uh, in uh, the Arctic uh, 
is not only uh, related to um, global warming, but you mentioned, Heidi, about green colonialism and uh, a, a lot of other issues uh, that are affecting uh, local uh, communities, uh, indigenous communities. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's such an important topic, and I'm glad we can bring this up today. Um, what we're seeing at the moment is that the Arctic is warming. I think after this conversation, we know this is pretty clear. Well, yeah. And it is making uh, resources more accessible. We know that the Arctic is full of rare earth minerals. We know that there is a lot of oil and gas in the Arctic. We know that there is also a lot of land in the Arctic. There's a lot of space. And at the moment, we are starting to see um, developed countries, organizations, industries, starting to exploit the resources of certain Arctic regions that are already inhabited by indigenous communities. And these indigenous communities are actually on the front line of climate change. They are some of the most affected populations in the world. They are really on the front line of what is taking place. But we're starting to, for example, invade their lands to build wind farms. We're starting to destroy some of their ecosystems to mine uranium, to mine for rare earth minerals. And it is essential today that no matter what is taking place in the Arctic right now, no matter what development everybody's talking about, we need to involve indigenous communities from the get-go. This is absolutely crucial, but not only indigenous leaders, indigenous experts, representatives, we also need to involve the youth. And I think what Gail is doing is uh, admirable, and this is absolutely what we need to do. How can we make decisions that will impact the next 30, 40, 50 years in the Arctic without involving the Arctic youth? And it's about time that we do this, and uh, for me, the full package would be to have on those decision boards, climate scientists, indigenous leaders, youth representatives, and the people from the private sectors. And I think then we can have a good decision-making process. Yes, uh, absolutely. It it's been a very core part of the conversation here at Change Now over these past three days. But making decisions and creating solutions for people or areas that are being affected without actually taking them into consideration. And it sounds very counterintuitive. Uh, how can we make a decision to su support a particular area of the world without uh, getting those people that are living there, that know the land, that know the area, that have been taking care of that part for centuries or millennia, I don't know, but <laughs> and not even putting, making them, having them part of the conversation. Uh, Gail, what are some of the solutions uh, that uh, you have seen proposed that you are most excited about? Because I want to really wrap up this conversation about solutions. What are some of the ones that you are the most excited about that you see this is what we need to bet on and this is really what we need to do because that's based on the data that we have that's going to work. Yeah, so, so before I answer that, I'll just say that we also have um, a young uh, uh, indigenous activist from Alaska joining us, Cassidy Kramer, uh, this year as well. So I completely agree with the need to bring in uh, indigenous uh, Arctic uh, youth as well. In terms of solutions, you know, I'm going to disappoint you, Simona. There's no silver bullet. There's no one way out of this. It's not, well, it is a little bit like the Don't Look Up movie where if we bet the bank on uh, the big techno fix, uh, you know, we're going to be sadly disappointed. And I've done research uh, with Johan Rockström and many others at Potsdam Institute that actually look through the feasibility of these things. So we can't just have, you know, plant more trees. We can't just, uh, you know, do carbon capture and storage. Uh, it, the real solution is we need to half emissions uh, by 2030. And in order to do that, we have to uh, phase out very rapidly coal. It has an end date. It has an expiry date. And we have to have absolutely no more new fossil fuel uh, uh, investment uh, in new developments starting now, starting last June. And that's not just me. Um, that is actually the International Energy Agency that has, has clearly made that uh, recommendation for, uh, for the safety of the 1.5C uh, uh, trajectory. So the thing that I'm the most excited about is that we have seen over the last two years how world leaders have actually put the fate of humanity uh, that was at threat because of COVID, because of the pandemic, they have put that, they have put us, people, 
ahead of the economy. And they have done things that they said were impossible. We've got a vaccine. Um, we did that with uh, incredible uh, rapidness. We did global um, uh, coordination of these things. We came together. Uh, you know, you saw it all the way along. You saw it at the grassroots level. You saw it at the at the national level. Yes, there were mistakes that were made. Yes, there was pushback. There's been, been uh, certainly all kinds of mistakes. But we are in a better place today than we were, um, you know, two years ago. And that gives me hope. And I think that's what we've got to do is we've really got to actually just start saying uh, it, it, we are in this, uh, you know, Apollo moment and, and, and giddy up. Let's just do it. Yeah, and if someone wants to, so it's not all doom and gloom. There no. is hope. And if there is one thing that uh, this uh, pandemic has taught us is that things can be done at scale. Things can be done at speed. So there is uh, no excuse. I w it has been done. So let's do it for other part and other issues like uh, uh, what's happening right now with global warming and issues in the Arctic. Uh, if someone wants to support you and your work, uh, Gail, what's the best way? Well, uh, you know, follow us and go to our website, of course. But but what I really would do is make a plea is is please donate to our youth program so we can bring uh, youth uh, activists to Davos in January 2023 and also develop uh, our educational materials so that that the youth that aren't at Davos but are doing all the good work on the ground all around the world, that they've got really good science training so they know how to actually respond to all those climate skeptics. So please donate to our not-for-profit registered in the Netherlands, and we can do cer certainly do with uh, more resources to make sure that the youth are heard by people in power. Uh, and what's the website? Where can we go? Uh, so, so if you go to arcticbasecamp.org, you will see all kinds of information on, yeah. on what you can do. ArcticBaseCamp.org. Go now, donate, and support. Uh, Heidi, how about you? What gives you hope? I mean, what gives me hope is to be here, for example, and to hear about all the solutions being discussed, being developed, starting with making science accessible. To me, this is such a priority of my work. It is a big priority at the Arctic Council as well. We can see that when the science is understood, when the science is there, made accessible to everyone, Immediately, people start to question, but hang on, what can I do at my own level? And we can all do so much. We all have a sphere of influence that is bigger than ourselves. We can all do something. We can all talk about what we're doing to hope for a snowball effect. And for the Arctic, of course, the situation is not in great shape, but it's not too late to avoid the worst consequences of climate change there. So let's be inspired after change now. As soon as we go home, let's make a pledge to Arctic Base Camp. Let's start to focus on these solutions, because if we save the Arctic, we we'll literally save ourselves. And where can we go to make that pledge and uh, how can we support? I would just continue supporting the work of scientists and uh, especially for my working group at the Arctic Council, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, AMAP.no, and we're building a big educational platform there, again, to make science accessible to everyone, especially to the youth and the indigenous communities. That's brilliant. Give them a massive round of applause. <laughs> Gal Weidman, Heidi Sebest, thank you very much. Wow. What a session. Now, as we mentioned here, things are not looking great, and that's the reality. However, something can be done. It's not too late, and we all have a personal responsibilities, whether it's uh, to share scientific information, whether it's uh, to give uh, people access to easier access to information or support, even with our money, with our action, and uh, together, I think we can change, and we can change things now. My name is Simone Vincenzi. It has been a pleasure hosting this session and have a fantastic rest of the day. Ciao. <laughs>